Welcome. Thank you all for attending today's webinar, Veterans Treatment Courts, Exploring Operations and Issues to Inform the Future. This webinar is brought to you by the National Drug Court Resource, Policy, and Evidence-Based Practice Center, or NDCRC, which is operated by the Justice Programs Office at American University and funded in part by the Bureau of Justice Assistance, Office of Justice Programs, U.S. Department of Justice. Points of view, opinions, and recommendations presented in this webinar are those of the panelists and do not represent the official position or policies of the U.S. Department of Justice. The NDCRC equips the treatment court field with a wide variety of open and accessible resources to help treatment courts run more effectively. Our work is centered on providing treatment court professionals with the information and resources they need to be successful. We're excited to get started and hope you are as well. Our panel today is comprised of researchers in the Veterans Treatment Court field whose articles have appeared in the Drug Court Review's Winter 2018 issue that focused specifically on Veterans Treatment Courts, or VTCs. The Drug Court Review is a peer-reviewed journal established by the NDCRC to promote research on issues relevant to the treatment court field. The journal seeks to inform practitioners and scholars alike about innovations in criminal justice practices, court operations, mental and behavioral health treatment, and more as related to treatment courts. I am your moderator, Elizabeth Brandeberry. I am a master's student in international development, a graduate research fellow in the Justice Programs Office, and an international development fellow for the Young Professionals in Foreign Policy. I serve as the managing editor of the Veterans Justice and Mental Health Newsletter, published by the National Drug Court Resource Center at the Justice Programs Office. I previously worked as a VTC coordinator in Montana for three years. Dr. Julie Marie Baldwin is the research director for the Justice Programs Office at AU, scholar in residence in the Department of Justice, Law, and Criminology at AU, research professor at Missouri State University, and editor of the Drug Court Review and the Veterans Justice and Mental Health Newsletter. Dr. Baldwin is a nationally recognized BTC expert, serving as a research partner and consultant for a variety of agencies and programs since 2010. To date, she has visited 46 BTCs and is actively working with 18 BTCs. Four of her current BTC projects are federally funded by the National Institute of Justice the Bureau of Justice Assistance, and the National Institute of Corrections. Prior to receiving her PhD, she worked as a court analyst for the New York State Supreme Court Appellate Division and as an Appeals Bureau Paralegal and FOIL Administrator in the Kings County District Attorney's Office. Dr. Erica J. Brooke is a lecturer in the Department of Sociology, Criminology, and Law at the University of Florida. She is a commissioned officer in the U.S. Army Reserves, where she has spent the last 12 years working in a variety of occupations in both the enlisted and officer ranks. Her recent research focuses on the courts to corrections pipeline, with special emphasis on the military service and crime relationship, problem-solving courts, and substance use and abuse. Dr. Brooke currently serves as a program evaluator and research consultant for local criminal justice agencies in the Central Florida region on multiple federally funded grants. Dr. John Gallagher is an assistant professor in the School of Social Work at the University of Arkansas and a licensed master social worker. His research focuses on diversion and re-entry from the criminal justice system with his recent work centering on improving communication between inmates and their minor children. Also, he focuses on veterans treatment courts with evaluations completed in Arizona and ongoing in Arkansas. Dr. Gallagher has 19 years of professional social work practice, serving homeless individuals, persons living with HIV AIDS, and individuals who receive behavioral health services. Dr. Paul A. Lucas is an assistant professor in the Department of Government and Justice Studies at Appalachian State University. His research and teaching focuses on courts, problem-solving courts, program evaluation, and criminal justice policy issues. And he currently serves as the drug court evaluator for the 23rd Judicial District, Kansas. 
Prior to obtaining his PhD, Dr. Lucas worked within the magisterial, criminal, and problem-solving court system in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where he was also a liaison to community corrections offices and local and state correctional institutions. In today's webinar, we will examine a variety of aspects and issues related to VTC. We'll start with a brief overview of the VTC concept and discuss its dissemination across the country. Then we'll take a closer look at the different ways in which the VTC concept has been adopted and implemented in various jurisdictions, touching on some implications of these variances that will be addressed again later. Our panelists will then address the numerous differences evident within the veteran and service member population and their importance as it relates to VTC. Building on the previously discussed variances in VTC programs and the non-uniformity of military service, the panelists will discuss the importance of military cultural competency and ways VTC programs can demonstrate and increase theirs. Peer mentorship is one of the more iconic VTC practices born out of the military culture. Our panelists will discuss what peer-to-peer -peer means, ways in which peer mentor programs are structured and operate, including roles, methods of engagement, and matching. Additionally, the challenges experienced by VTCs in implementing the peer mentor component will be examined. Finally, we'll talk about the implications, lessons learned, and recommendations related to VTC practice, policy, and research. Now, I would like to hand it over to Dr. Baldwin, who will start the conversation on VTCs. Thank you, Lizzie. <clears throat> so, um, can they hear me? Okay. Um, the Veterans Treatment Court is a specialized court in our public court system for offenders with a history of military service. Um, while there has been a history of acknowledgement of military service in the legal system, for example, the use of military service as a mitigating factor in sentencing, the concept emerged in the mid 2000s. The first account of a, VC of a VTC program that I've actually come across is in the Smith 2012 article that examines the 2005 Veterans Treatment Court in Anchorage, Alaska. That article also references VTC programs in California. Um, but the most well-known and publicized program that I think that we're all familiar with is Judge Russell's 2008 Buffalo Veterans Treatment Court which is where we see the emergence of the VJO, which we're really gonna get into a little later on. Um, similar to other specialized courts, the Veterans Treatment Court aims to address the underlying causes and correlates of criminal behavior, and VTCs have a treatment court team that adopts a non-adversarial approach to case processing. Um, treatment and service engagement are mandated through the court, and a graduated system of rewards and sanctions is to be used. Additionally, participation is to be voluntary. Um, some differences, some major differences between the Veterans Treatment Court and other specialized courts include the inclusion of the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. And this is primarily through the Veterans Justice Outreach Specialist or Officer. Um, that individual is actually employed by the VA and as part of their uh, duties, they can serve as a liaison between the VA and the VTC. And then also the VA is present in the provision of treatment and services to eligible VTC participants. Um, additionally, the target population for VTCs is essentially status specific. So at the most basic level, these programs target military veterans and service members, while other types of specialized courts such as drug courts or mental health courts may focus on particular types of legal or extra legal issues such as mental and or behavioral health. Um, based on these differences, many of us consider VTCs to be the most complex type of specialized court in operation today. Um, further, the VTC concept, as we're going to see, has been adopted and implemented in a variety of ways um, across the country. So in terms of today's scale, basically since the mid-2000s, the VTC has rapidly disseminated across the country through judi judicial innovations, legal and community actors, and even legislation. Reports really vary on the number of VTCs that are in operation um, due to the data collection methods and their sources of data. Um, some include VTC dockets and VCT tra VTC tracks as well. But the recent reports, I think the last two that I've seen were in 2018, and 
So the numbers range for those from 407 to 551 VTCs across the country. Um, so really the question is kind of why have these proliferated so quickly? And I know some of my fellow panelists have some um, rationale to why this is the case. John? Thanks, Julie. Um, and thanks everyone for joining us today. So, you know, it's, it's really, it's just been kind of fascinating to watch for the last several years that I've been involved. Every, every time I go to write a new review for an article, the number that Julie mentioned of courts known in existence goes up. So um, it's just kind of fascinating to watch. And, it, you know, when we start to reflect on it, there seems to be a lot of factors going into it. One really seems to be the very high social regard that veterans are held in today. I think that our country has been trying very hard to not repeat the mistakes of how returning soldiers and other service members were treated after Vietnam. So folks are, even people who are opposed to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, there really has been a very wide cultural emphasis on serving those who have served us. And then beyond that attitude, there's just been huge infrastructure to allow these courts to proliferate. So, you know, the drug court model, especially to a lesser extent, the mental health court model has, you know, since the 80s, courts around the country have figured out creative ways to run these types of partnerships. Judges have developed skills through other problem solving courts of working with treatment providers, overseeing treatment interventions, and then there are other forms of infrastructure. So many of the large federal funding streams that have historically been available for drug courts, um, especially SAMHSA programs and BJA programs have been made available to veterans courts. Um, we also see that kind of softer infrastructure of the, you know, the National Association of Drug Court Professionals which disseminates a wealth of information for those working in drug courts has actively supported through the um, veterans just no, through the uh, justice for vets components, basically the same type of dissemination for the emerging veterans court model. And then just the VA itself has to be recognized as a national bit of that infrastructure. You know, Julie's already alluded to the BJO component that does the liaison work with the courts. And then there's the treatment providers at VA hospitals and clinics throughout the country. So all of this type of, of table setting seems to really set up what's been just a remarkable and ongoing pace of, pace of dissemination. It's funny, that number of 500 something that, that Dr. Baldwin mentioned a few minutes ago was actually new to me. The, the, the article I was writing last week, I was using 400, so I'm going to need to email Julie for an updated citation. Erica, did you have anything else to add to that? John pretty much covered it. The, um, the only thing that I would add is that these are relatively inexpensive to actually establish because they are using um, the VA system currently uh, the, for the vast majority of clients going through. So that's at no cost to the court. There's only really an administrative expense. Um, a lot of the courts are piggybacking their veterans courts off of drug courts so they already have the personnel there and are able to apply for grants to kind of subsidize that additional administrative work. Help if I unmute it. Thank you for the excellent discussion. Now we'll hear from the panelists on the variety of ways in which VTCs operate. So first we'll start with the uh, veteran court team and partnerships and how we see some of those inconsistencies across applications. Uh, in my personal experience, I've seen some courts that are very well connected with the local veterans organizations within the community. In fact, the veterans court kind of becomes um, an outlet for, for other veterans um, organizations and um, different types of services to actually connect. And then I see other programs to where there is very much a disconnect between the local veteran service organizations and the court. Um, that could be due to a variety of, they kind of don't share the same missions or that the community is just not aware of that. 
Um, and then you see that, that inconsistency with the team as well, um, as how involved the team members are with the actual court process, um, whether they have military service in their background at all, um, and kind of how invested they are with the program, as we would see consistently with any drug or mental health court, things like that. Another thing I've seen across courts um, regarded to the team, the makeup of the team is the number of treatment providers and types of treatment providers, which we'll get into later, but the number of treatment providers to the number of criminal justice actors. Um, you know, some courts, Erica, you might know of a few that have, say, three, um, <clears throat> three prosecutors on it, um, where other programs have one. Some might have seven treatment providers. Others might have one. So um, I think the, the team makeup really varies based on the services that are available and mandated by the programs and the resources that are available. So um, there's big variation across programs there. And, and this is just one other thing I think also, so we have the team membership, which is important, but then it's, it's not necessarily a given that all members function the same across courts. So, you know, traditionally in drug courts and I think most veterans courts, the judge is, is kind of thought of as the program leader. I've seen a court where it's really been driven by a prosecutor. Um, so even if, you know, similar players are at the table, the roles can be different. You know, in all the problem solving courts, the, uh, the role of the defense attorney can be particularly challenging and have seen defense attorneys in veterans courts taking different postures, you know, ranging from fully embracing the, the collaborative team model of being as non-adversarial as possible and to an extent that, you know, the, the defendant, the participants waive the right to, uh, you know, affirmative advocacy from counsel upon entering the program. And I've seen other defense attorneys that are still within that context advocating for their clients with the treatment team. And you can see similar things with how the peers function or the clinicians. Great, and then moving to jurisdiction. So they also vary <laughs> across this. Um, so they exist in a variety of jurisdictions. So we have some BTCs that are the municipal, county, there's some are at the regional level with multiple counties. Um, we do have some, a couple uh, federal VTC programs out there. Um, this affects whether programs take, some just take our misdemeanor courts, some are felony courts only, um, some will do misdemeanors and felonies. Some programs are also have jurisdiction over some civil infractions. Um, and then programs vary as to whether they're pre or post adjudication. Um, one thing that I've recently seen that's interesting is the transfer issue. So if there's a, uh, an, uh, an offender with a history of military service in a jurisdiction that does not have a veterans court, but a neighboring jurisdiction does, we've seen transfers where those VTC programs will accept um, participants who do not live um, inside the, the VTCs initial jurisdiction. Um, usually the determining entities for that I've seen be probation because they are the ones who will have to be doing the supervision. The judge, the prosecution, and the coordinator, those are the main four that I've seen had to agree for those and work towards those transfers. Um, with the use of telehealth, um, I think that's become a little more possible uh, for the transfers, but some courts that do take transfers will only take them if they are in a neighboring jurisdiction and can attend court um, either once a month and then the rest of the time through telecommunication. Um, so I think that's kind of something that's interesting for some programs. Um, if nobody has anything else to add to that one, I'll move on to the identification of potential participants. Um, in the national survey I did a few years ago and then in my work since then, one of the issues that programs or one of the challenges that programs have consistently brought up is the identification of potential participants. So getting the offenders who do, identifying whether an offender has a history of military service. So. Um, we've seen judges ask, we've seen um, 
little cards to be filled out in the jails. Um, we have some at intake, sometimes they will have it on the form for the individual to fill out. And a lot of these things re rely on self-report from the veteran or service, me service members themselves, which can be problematic because um, individuals don't either, they don't always want to either identify themselves as a veteran um, for a variety of reasons. This could be loss of benefits if they are incarcerated for a period of time um, or for shame not wanting people to know that they are a veteran and in the criminal justice system or from actually not even identifying with the term veteran. So programs often, I try to tell them to not use the term veteran, um, try and just determine whether they have some type of history um, of service with the military, leaving it very broad and general and inclusive. Um, so one of the, one thing that we've seen in a few courts is the use of a, the VRSS, um, which is basically a, a database where a jail can input uh, the intake list and it cross-references it with the VA database and it will spit it back out. It'll flag the individuals who do have a history of military service um, for a specified individual who can have access to it, such as the um, a court coordinator if they're granted access um, or the VJOs typically get this. Um, anybody want to say anything else about identification? Yes. Julie, some additional things that I've seen is um, beyond just system identification, as in when they, as when the client comes through the criminal justice system, are they being identified by court actors, et cetera, is that a lot of participants actually learn about these programs via word of mouth. Um, usually what we'll hear is that somebody was in jail and they heard from a fellow inmate about this great program and they do some investigation on their own. Also, we've seen that individuals will seek um, other avenues on getting in, for example, looking at websites of court jurisdictions. So if you were to have some items on there advertising that you have a veterans court program, um, some of the jails, their veteran dorms advertise that they have veteran court programs. And that's a lot of times how service members who fall through the identified cracks actually end up in the program as well. We see some of that too. And then on the flip side of the coin, we see that when folks kind of get excited about this, we see that sometimes um, people are identifying and referring folks to these programs at a fast pace and may not understand what the eligibility requirements are. Um, they could be basic low-level offenses, as in traffic violations, which some courts may not accept. And we see that other court actors, whether it be attorneys, court deputies, um, judges referring folks, to these veteran programs because they are a veteran. So this can be kind of accessibly used at times. And then moving to the eligibility requirements and target populations, uh, these also vary by VTC program. So there are different types of eligib eligibility requirements that we've seen. So military status, VA eligibility, uh, legal charges and extra legal issues and nexus. So for military status, some programs will only take um, individuals who are veterans, so they are not current service members. Other programs will take those that are currently enlisted as well as veterans. Um, their VA eligibility status, so this often, or in military status and VA eligibility status, this is tied to their discharge status. Um, and so programs often have restrictions as to um, the type of discharge that individuals can have. Um, I think for the VA eligibility, a lot of programs that do only take VA eligible participants, potential participants, is because of a lack of services um, in the community. So if you are taking a, if your program takes VA eligible and VA ineligible, you have to have, you have to be able to provide services for both groups, right? And the VA eligible will get services through the VA and the VA ineligible will get them um, in the community. Um, charge restrictions, these are often set by um, legislation or um, entities outside of the court's control. So even if they want to take 
more uh, severe charges or say domestic violence charges or interpersonal violence charges, things of that nature, um, they may be restricted by the policies in their jurisdictions. Um, and then extra legal issues. So we're talking about substance use disorders, mental health issues, um, some, you know, if the services, if they do not have the services for certain issues in an area, they might not be able to serve that set of individuals. Um, and so their eligibility requirements may reflect that. And then there's this also this notion of the nexus. So the nexus of either the actual crime that has potentially occurred with some type of mental health or some type of extra legal issue that then has to be tied to military service. So some courts have a um, variety of eligibility requirements um, regarding some type of nexus with military service. Um, and then this exclusivity can really result in some small, small participation groups for some programs. So, you know, We've seen programs that have caseloads of 150, and then I've seen them down to one to three individuals. And sometimes this is because their eligibility requirements are either so exclusive or they don't really understand the needs of the veteran population or military service member um, population in their area and their eligibility requirements aren't really reflecting um, the needs of the, the area population. Paul, you want to talk about high-risk high need? Absolutely. So within the best practices, uh, according to the drug court literature, this recommends identifying high risk, high need participants. And this is for a number of reasons. And this approach has been validated through the vast amount of research that has been conducted on drug courts. Now, high risk individuals tend to have less successful outcomes within standard rehabilitative approaches, and they require a much more targeted and intensive supervision approach. This is something that uh, problem-solving courts, and this is to include veterans treatment courts, are exceptionally well-suited to meet given the structure of the programs and what tracks they follow through the phases that they implement. Now, I want to be very clear that this does not mean high risk for violence or violent offending, and this is sometimes confused uh, both within practitioners and um, academics researching these courts, but rather it is a potential indication of a return to the same antisocial behaviors which had gotten them involved within the criminal justice system in the first place. Now, when uh, we're looking at high need, these participants include individuals with substance dependence, and we'll talk more about abuse and dependence and the difference here in a, a moment major psychiatric disorders to include brain injury and or a lack of basic needs such as employment or any other type of daily living skills. Now, given the high prevalence within the veteran population of PTSD, uh, TBI, traumatic brain injury, and of course the potential for substance dependence in order to self-medicate, research would suggest that VTCs should be able to effectively treat a high risk, high need population and decrease future contact within the criminal justice system. Now, I also want to point out that just because an individual is arrested for a drug-related crime, this does not necessarily mean that they are dependent on that substance. So we have to make that uh, uh, discern discernment there that not all individuals coming in with a drug-related crime are dependent on that, and many substance users are uh, assessed to be not dependent on their substances of choice, meaning we have to be very careful with an intake and assessment of these individuals to make sure that we are putting them in less intensive alternatives instead of the high impact of VTC uh, court dockets. Now, when focusing on high risk, high need populations, problem solving courts have been shown to reduce reoffending twice as much as programs that serve less serious offenders, and they return approximately 50% greater cost benefits to their communities because, of course, they're focused on higher level offending and more uh, uh, criminal persistent participants within those courts. So therefore, it would behoove VTCs to ensure that their admission criteria reflect targeting high-risk, high-need populations of justice-involved veterans through evidence-based assessment tools, which there's current research currently being uh, conducted on that, but there's nothing substantial out there currently uh, for a national evidence-based assessment tool to be used. And one important issue that I'd like to point out is that in some VTCs, participants are not adequately 
screened by the VA if they're using VA services, which many of them do, until their admittance into the, the program itself. So essentially, they're putting the cart before the horse, and this is an issue that will be discussed more uh, in more detail in the coming slides, uh, according to who are we bringing into these courts, what are the criteria, and who we should be focused on. Great. Anybody else want to touch on eligibility requirements before we move? Okay. Um, so participation requirements and treatments and services available, um, as I think we've probably already touched on, these really vary by jurisdiction. So it really varies by the resources available. And so based on that, um, programs may target or have services for that are very that might be more specific to the veteran population, military service population, than others. So some programs have specific uh, treatments for PTSD, TBI, and IPV or, or DV. Um, and I think John will talk a little bit about the Strength at Home program. Sure. Thanks, Julie. So you know, and it's so part of it is kind of. Building on what Julie was saying, you know, you have differences in jurisdictions, different states might have different requirements, no, might, they do, for certain types of court-mandated treatment, especially domestic or interpersonal violence and uh, DUI. And so, you know, one of the more exciting things recently is the VA has been doing what, what seems to be, it's early, but some very promising research on their strength at home program, so which is you know, work. If it's, I don't think it's officially thought of as an evidence-based intervention yet, but it's if not, it's, it seems to be on its way of a basically a you know a veteran-centric family violence interpersonal communication program that um, VA is doing some good training on. So you know, it's just another form of that infrastructure that we see supporting the ability to not only roll these courts out across the country, but to develop and deliver interventions that are really well targeted to the, you know, to the, the multiple niches that are going on here, criminal justice involvement, family violence, but also veteran status. Great, John, thank you. Um, but he also know on strength at home. Um, so there's been a few evaluations that have been done that are promising that have been done, um, I believe, by the VA. And I'm currently working with a court to implement it and evaluate it in their program. So it'll be one of the first external evaluations of it. Um, so if anyone has questions about that or really anything that we do cover today, um, we will have everyone's contact information um, at the end of the slides. And just as a reminder for what Lizzie said initially, um, feel free to ask questions. You can ask them throughout if you want in the Q&A, but we will address them at the end. Um, Eric and John, you want to take on sanctions and incentives? Yeah. Um, so going on the theme of inconsistencies in applications, it definitely applies to sanctions and incentives. We know that the veteran court programs, as they currently are today, are kind of loosely based on that drug court model, as in they would follow some of the same incentive and sanction procedures as we would see in drug courts. Um, however, I've seen across different courts the use of sanctions. Now, some courts are a little more regimented with that, as in they have a schedule that they follow verbatim and it's no question to the defendants when they come in exactly uh, what sanction they're up for, um, et cetera. But those with schedules I also see where they sometimes can stretch out um, how many sanctions an individual needs. On the flip side, I see courts that do have um, a sanction schedule in place as in they've created one and usually they've had to create one based on um, what they're what they're reading um, from their, their different grant funders and things like that require them, uh, different ideologies behind that. But it is not used in a consistent manner, as in some participants seem to receive sanctions, while other participants who may have engaged in the same type of misbehavior do not. And that can create some kind of dissension among the court participants. Um, and they do talk across jurisdictions, the different courts on exactly what they're receiving. But in terms of incentives, 
Um, haven't seen very many of them. I know I talked to some of the panelists and they were saying the same thing. Um, traditionally, what we see in terms of an incentive would be at graduation, the participant would receive a um, certificate in a coin, also known as a challenge coin at the end for a job well done. Um, another incentive might be um, where they get to stretch out perhaps court days so they're not having to come every week or every two weeks. It may be um, you know, once a month, et cetera, but haven't seen anything like gift cards or any of that that you would see in drug court. John? I think, and really, just most, mostly my comment is, you know, just agreeing with Erica. And it's, it's that last piece that is really interesting to me. You know, there seems to be some anecdotal from talking to people at conferences, um, you know, that's on, on, on why there's not the heavy use of things like gift cards. I mean, some people are reporting that some veterans kind of feel that they're a little trivial it to be given a gift card for doing kind of what you're supposed to be doing and there, you know, the, the sanction, the, I mean, the, the reward seems to be more, you know, like Erica was mentioning increased time between, between dockets or the ability to go first and get it, get out quickly challenge point on completion and then kind of the idea of social praise and social connection. So that's just an interesting deviation from the drug court model to watch. The only thing I want to add is that um, in the term of the graduated system of, of um, sanctions, um, I have seen some programs, so we know that incarceration or short stints of incarceration, um, if they're being used, should be the very like last, and sa last um, sanction, and then after that is termination. So some programs I've seen just not use um, incarceration, which I believe is just fine. Um, but the the actual termination, I've encountered a few programs that will not terminate participants. So they may still be in the program essentially after three years. Um, and I don't know if anybody else has seen that, but that is something that I've just recently come in contact with. Yes, Julie, I've, I've seen some of that. And going off the graduated sanctions, sometimes when an individual has reached the max amount, they will consider, they will continue, excuse me, to receive that same max amount. So that same um, number of days in jail for numerous times until the team has come to a consensus that this individual can no longer um, be helped. But a lot of the terminations happen to do with not so much participant noncompliance as it's new charges. And that depends on what the new charge is. Have you seen it where, because some of this, what I've seen is that the, the team does not want to give up on the individual and feels like it's quitting. Um, I find that um, interesting. I've seen some of that, but I've also seen some of the opposite where the team is very much um, on board with saying goodbye to the participant, but it's one powerful court actor who has um, the most say who really puts the kibosh on that. And it's, it's interesting. I've, I've seen that last phenomena that Erica was mentioning where there's, if, you, if there was the ability to have a vote of the team, you know, 60%, the person would be gone, but one or two strong actors. And that's also something, the most recent example that I'm thinking of, I've seen in a drug court. So it's certainly not unique to veteran court, but I, I'd be curious over time if there's even greater reluctance among some some teams to terminate a person who's who's served in the military versus someone who hasn't. Okay, um, Paul and John, do you want to dive into performance measures and metrics of success? Yeah, sure. Um, so recidivism tends to be the standard measurement used by many problem-solving courts, and this is both within program and post-program assessments. And while this does grant evaluators uh, a pretty decent measuring stick, it's only but one aspect of program success, and albeit it is one that can be understood by um, non-evaluators and practitioners, but what we may be losing is quality of life variables in capturing that data, which is extraordinarily important in understanding the long-term impact that veterans treatment courts or any problem-solving court has 
does on the participants who successfully navigate the program requirements. And the issue of solely relying on recidivism is that we are missing these other very important outcome measures related to quality of life, such as continued employment. Um, are they continually uh, um, securing housing? Are they regaining custody of their children? Are they maintaining custody of their children and other family relations? Continued sobriety and, of course, desistance from uh, typical antisocial behaviors, uh, just to name a few. And an important aspect to this is tracking past graduates and even program participants who have been removed from the program in order to conduct these follow-up surveys and interviews. And this will ensure that this vital information can and will be uh, captured for assessment purposes. Now, what I've seen in the course that I've worked within that we've tried to do these post-program assessments is that once these veterans are done with the program, they want to be done with the program. So tracking them and having their updated information if they're moving around or even having that high response rate given from them um, to collect this data can be problematic, but one that these courts should be focused on and continually adapting to make sure that we get uh, uh, good response rates and good information from the previous court participants. And, and I would just kind of build on that, you know, a little bit, I think, to back up to the recidivism, and I agree with everything Paul's saying, that if we're only looking at recidivism, we're missing a wealth of the world. Um, so I, I would wholeheartedly endorse that. But also to remember how differently recidivism is measured and to be kind of talking and thinking about that and to be using, you know, to be strategic in what we're measuring for recidivism. So, you know, the different ways it can be measured, you know, one is, you know, it's kind of like what counts as recidivism? Is it any time you were arrested? Uh, we have a right, you know, we have a presumption of innocence in this country. So is it kind of logically appropriate to call someone who was arrested but ultimately acquitted a recidivist? That happens frequently. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, we could only consider someone to have recidivated if they were you know, adjudicated guilty or pled guilty. There's that issue. There's the, you know, the charge issue is, is interesting to think about. Some recidivism studies will only look at similar types of crime, right? So if someone entered a veterans court or another diversion program with a domestic violence offense, um, certainly we don't want the person shoplifting in a year, but if there's no other family violence, we, we want to at least be able to differentiate some of those types of things in an ideal world, um, the length of time we follow up. And then also, you know, to build on Paul's point about the quality of life and the social measures, they're important on their own, but they're also important, you know, if we have enough people in a, in a particular court that's being studied or if we're pooling multiple courts, we can start to look at them and how they relate to each other, right? Is there a reason to think that, you know, treatment effect is different based on people who secured housing or, or put, you know, or, or improved family functioning with a spouse? Continuing to build on John and Paul's points, um, looking at the use of data amongst the courts is obviously very inconsistent. Some folks use data to actually improve the programs while others will use the data just to check the block on the funding requirements. And if programs were able to actually collect sound data, we could see a lot of changes and improvements in these programs and be able to do that cross court comparison to see kind of what's working and what's not working um, amongst these 500 different courts. Absolutely. And, and touching base on uh, a previous slide about the variability with how these courts operate, what I've seen and experienced is that in courts that are pre-plea, if new charges are picked up, as John was saying, it never resulted, if they successfully navigate the program, it never results in a conviction. That will be added to the, uh, uh, the Veterans Treatment Court docket and then therefore will be expunged versus a court that might be post-plea, where they will have to plea to that charge and it may be counted as recidivism there. And that's why we can look at this variability between courts of any type of specialty courts where some have a recidivism rate of as low as 3% that have been operating for years upon years years and others have a much higher recidivism rate and it's just how they're capturing what is recidivism and a lot of that goes into the variability of court uh, procedures.
Erica, do you want to touch on um, how the military culture is um, evident in various types of veterans treatment courts? Yes, we actually see um, the different uh, proliferations of military culture in the courts, um, not only via the court actors and the teams, but also the participants themselves. So you'll see differences in courts um, in terms of looking at the court actors. You will see that a good portion of the court actors um, maybe have military experience, so they're very on board with the Veterans Court, and you can see how kind of um, their energy exudes on the other team members, and it's a very um, collective, cohesive um, team. And then others, you see it very sterile, very that typical adversarial uh, courtroom process. Some folks may have service, they may not have service, but that doesn't really come into the, the court arena. On the flip side, you see how military culture um, comes out among the participants. You see in some courts, you see that there's real camaraderie that's, that's happening, that um, the different defendants enjoy being around other veterans. And then you see in other courts where the veterans aren't really concerned with that camaraderie. Um, they just look at it as another day in court. They're not looking to make friends. Um, very different. And I encourage folks who have ever gone into a drug court um, go into a veterans court and see how the vibe is very different across uh, courts and how military culture kind of somehow plays a role into that. And really, I would recommend not just visiting one veterans court, but multiple. Um, so I've walked into veterans courts where I wouldn't even know that it's actually a veterans court, except that I'm there because it is supposed to be veterans court. Um, I have been to veterans courts that start with some type of ceremony or color guard at the beginning. Um, you have the flags, you have the branch insignia, um, you have you know, the verbiage that's used. I have seen um, a judge in a camo robe. So it really varies uh, by court. Um, and so, yeah, I really would just encourage people to go to multiple. Now that we've covered the variability in VTC program, we'll examine the non-uniformity of military service. Please note the importance of these complexities and how VTCs can demonstrate and increase their cultural competency will be addressed later. Dr. Brooke, would you like to start our discussion on the complexity and non-uniformity of military service? Yes, thank you. Um, so this is something that is absolutely missing from the research as a whole and looking at military service and its impact and criminal behavior. Hey, Erica, are you unmuted? I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? I was able to hear you fine. Okay. All right, so I'm just going to go ahead and continue. So this is something we definitely see missing from. Okay, you want to start on this slide? Can you hear, can everybody else hear me? Yeah. Okay. All right, so technical difficulty. Okay. So take three. All right, so this is something that's definitely missing from um, the current research we see out there is kind of looking at the non-uniformity of military service. We have a habit of kind of um, lumping all veterans together, um, and that's really not the case because we do have very unique experiences, and we need to take into account that veterans within these programs are going to have these unique experiences and kind of um, tailor some of our um, treatments and how we are kind of progressing in the court, just kind of keeping these in mind. So the first one being era. Era of service makes a big difference. Um, there's a lot of staples across the military that, that stay the same over time, but there's a lot of things that change. Okay, so Vietnam veterans are going to be very different from your post 9-11 veterans today. It's a different type of battlefield. Also, there's different types of support from the community for both of these groups there. Um, some courts you'll see, depending on where they're at, you'll see um, it dominated by one specific service era versus in other areas where there's maybe a little more diverse jurisdiction, you'll see um, different types of service eras kind of mixed into the court. And so that's important to, to take into account, especially as we talk about uh, peer mentors down the road. Also, branch type is very different. Um, our Marine Corps and our Army tend to be more of our ground combat troops. 
Um, so they have very different experiences than folks in different types of branches. And so, and they come with different jobs. So that's something that we have to also keep in mind. Um, also looking at the sex of individuals. Uh, we've just recently opened up uh, combat roles to, to females. So that will be interesting to see um, as we progress along, if we see any of those females who participate in combat arms types of MOSs um, coming into the court system. And also recognizing those unique experiences, um, especially when we're talking about military sexual trauma, MST, it's not just reserved for females. We also do see males as well that experience this and some of them aren't as open as others. Age is important. So when folks enter into the service, at what age they come in, we've actually seen that military service um, does impact the life course. Um, people who enter in at a young age, as in they're coming out of high school or in their early 20s, may have a very different experience than folks who enter in um, 30 or 40 years old. And I can tell you during the height of our surge in about 2007, 2008, 2006, that time frame. Our max age was 42, and you were seeing folks who were 42 years old joining the Army for the first time um, and any of the branches that would take that age. So keep that in mind that folks, are, these aren't just young folks entering. Um, they can enter at any point in time. Also, their lived experience. So this includes lived experience pre, during, and post-service. So looking at um, folks when they enter, what kind of experiences they come into the service with, well, obviously impact their time in the service and obviously how they experience service, how, what their time in service is like will definitely impact whether they view their service as a positive or negative experience and that will kind of translate into how they identify with the court. Um, looking at enlistment and separation, we see that a lot of folks enter into the military a variety of ways. Okay, some of the most uh, common ways we hear about is the draft, um, or we see the volunteer force today. Um, there are um, still remnants of folks who were given the option to enter into the service or go to jail. Um, there was actually a young man that I served with who actually in modern times was given that option. So there's a variety of different ways how people enter into the service and why they enter into the service um, that definitely can impact their viewpoint on it as well. And then looking at separations. So separations can happen for a variety of reasons. The most traditional being honorable, they've done their, their time, it's time for them to get out, but we see a lot of different discharges. And during our, I wanna say, our, during the height of our surge, a lot of people were getting processed out on other than honorable or dishonorable discharges um, because we didn't understand kind of the effects of PTSD. And so different, service members would be acting out, whether it be drugs, um, alcohol, mental health, et cetera. And the Army would discharge, the Army or any branch, would discharge them based on those types of facts rather than looking at the PTSD being the root cause. So we're actually going back um, with a lot of those discharges and folks are going through the process of upgrading them and things like that. So that's important to keep in mind um, that separation doesn't necessarily equal performance in the military um, some of the time. And then that veteran identity. Some folks are very proud of their service and some folks just wanna move on from it. So you have to have that ex kind of that expectation that um, service members are going to kind of enjoy their, or what do I wanna say, kind of look at their service in a variety of different ways. So while you um, as a practitioner or a researcher may look at it as a positive thing, the veteran you're talking to may not or vice versa. So you kind of have to take that into, into account that they identify very differently. And a lot of times you'll see veterans when they're connected with each other, kind of look at each other like siblings, um, you know, to outsiders, but then even amongst themselves, we see a lot of that diversity. As in we see some veterans within the courts saying, well, I'm not like one of these guys here. I don't have all these issues. Or on the flip side, you see veterans saying, hey, I really like how um, other folks who have these issues just like me are in this program and I'm not alone. So hopefully that clarifies a little bit of difference um, between the non-uniformity of military service, which leads into cultural competency. So, <clears throat> 
generally we know the importance of cultural competency, that it can improve efficacy, <clears throat> and it can provide a context for symptoms and conditions. Um, so understanding uh, the complexities of service and understanding more about the military culture, I think, is very important for these programs. Um, and if any other panelists have any other recommendations, but I'm familiar with the VA, uh, the, the VA has a toolkit um, for military cultural competence. Um, and so I would encourage individuals to look at that. And I know some of our other panelists have seen more local trainings on military cultural competency. John, I think you have, right? Yes, definitely. And, and, and so I think, you know, part of this is knowing your community, what resources exist. But like in Arizona, for example, there was a very robust um, military families coalition that, that routinely was running good quality statewide trainings on, you know, military culture. So there may be something that exists. I also would echo Julie's um, notice of the VA's online toolkits is a good kind of static starting point, um, but seeing what's out there locally. And also it's, it's different than military cultural training, but also, you know, keep an open eye and ear for other, a lot of the other federal funding streams are, are being attentive to the needs of folks who are serving, have served family members, right? So a lot of the uh, SAMHSA grants currently out there for like mental health first aid training through their mental health awareness training, there's like specific modules on mental health first aid, which is just a good basic overview of signs and symptoms and how to refer for people who aren't behavioral health professionals. And the, the folks who developed that general intervention have started spinning off subpopulations. So they have one for law enforcement, they have one for schools, but importantly for this conversation, there's also a mental health first aid for the veterans community. So think kind of broadly and creatively as you patch together your resources. And just one other comment, you know, kind of back up to, to what Erica's table setting on all of the diversity you know, within the, within the military veteran umbrella. You know, I, as a social work educator, we talk and think a lot about cultural competency. And it's just so important to remember and wrestle with both, like all of the, you know, we, there's all of the diversity that exists between groups, whether it's we're talking about, you know, sexual orientation or ethnicity, there's also the diversity that, that exists within groups. So just as if, you know, you wouldn't go to one cultural competency training and know everything about an ethnic group or be able to work equally with people under that broad term, the same thing applies to veteran status for all the reasons Erica was laying out so well. I just want to add to being attuned to the different um, issues and challenges um, across these different variables. So one thing that I've seen is, you know, if, if an individual enters into the service uh, at a fairly young age, so say just after high school, then they essentially enter the military before they've kind of learned to balance a checkbook, um, acquire their own housing and things like that. And a lot of that the military takes care of while they're in service. And so when they come out, they have struggles with those where I normally wouldn't think that that would be you know, an issue with somebody in their late 20s. But if they've entered into the service at a certain part in their lifetime and exited, those are things to take into account. Another one is um, suicide is a, is a major issue for this population. And so um, I haven't seen too much of this, but I'm really trying to promote this, that uh, VTC team members um, do some type of training in suicide prevention. I know that I have, QPR has one that's specific to um, those who work with veterans. Um, so that would be something to check out for, for teams also. You know, Julie, I wanted to comment on that uh, just real quick. I haven't seen, and I don't know if any of the panelists seen, but I haven't seen that issue um, about suicide within my specific courts or the, the folks that I have worked with. Um, I'm not sure how prevalent it is out there. I'm, I'm sure that it occurs. I know that among veterans as a whole, you know, there's a statistic out there, um, one in 22. 
But I'm wondering if the if there is a lack, if the lack of um, folks who enter these programs um, engaging in suicide, if if that's due to their connection to VA resources, because a lot of the um, issues that we see when it's tied to suicides is because the veteran couldn't get help. They couldn't get the VA, the VA put them on the phone, on the waiting list, whatever it may be. So I'm wondering if this kind of, this connection to the VA through the vet court actually helps with that. It could, and that's something really to look into. And it's also, you know, some people just don't reach out for help. And it's also an issue in rural areas with access to service. Um, and so, you know, I've been on some projects that focus specifically in rural areas on suicide prevention among veterans. But um, I unfortunately have uh, worked with a few programs that have lost participants to suicide. And um, it has not happened in the majority of courts that I've worked with, but it has happened um, in three of them. And so over the years, and so I, I still think it's an important issue. And I, it's interesting that I don't see more programs, um, you know, thinking about it on the front end. Unfortunately, it's, it's after the fact. And so I think, you know, with this population um, and with all the access and with the ability to get a service connection for them, it's important for, I think, VTC teams to be cognizant that, um, you know, suicide can be an issue uh, within the population. You know, it's, I, I haven't heard a lot about this, which is shocking for the reasons we all know. What I have seen, though, on the positive side, one of the courts I've worked with in Arizona has really leveraged some of their other partnerships with local behavioral health providers. And, and you know, it's, it's a large city with large city resources, so this, this doesn't roll out well to a rural community. But they've actually been able to set up a crisis mobile team that's, that, at, that have a, a number of teams have at least one veteran on the team. So they're actually able to deploy people with mental health qualifications and a veteran peer. So that's a service that's available to veterans participating in that particular veterans court and also to other folks in the local veterans community. And that really came from that type of smart partnership that, you know, at the beginning we were alluding to who are your team members. You know, sometimes the team members aren't even those people that are like doing the case staffing, but they're, they're the team that builds the broader response system. One of the most iconic features of the Veterans Treatment Court model is peer mentorship. Starting off this conversation will be Dr. Lucas. Thank you. And yeah, and while it is one of the most iconic features of VTCs, it's one that we know very, very little about, which is surprising. And while many programs have peer mentor uh, programs and relationships set up within the court, some don't require it at all. So some of VTCs don't have it, but they are considered essential by many and therefore they're included within the operations. Now, peer-to-peer -peer mentoring also is briefly mentioned within the uh, key components of VTCs, although not much other information is given regarding its use and program structure. It's kind of a uh, place there that, yes, we're going to link these veterans with uh, peers that can help them and mentors that can help them, um, but not much other information is given, which uh, provides a lot of variability to different courts and programs uh, that include peer mentor programs going about it in very different ways. So the inclusion of these mentoring programs within VTCs speaks to the camaraderie, I feel, uh, shared by current military members and veterans, and they represent a distinct subculture which places loyalty to its members above all else. And that's really what VTCs are structured around in helping veterans and veterans, uh, other veterans helping um, other service members and veterans themselves. And this is referenced in the leave no veteran behind mantra that in many of the courts that I've looked at and worked within um, was number one, right? A veteran is a veteran. We're not going to leave any veteran behind. The goal of these programs is to allow the court participants ac access to a friendly face per se 
uh, who hopefully understands what they are going through and they can act as a sounding board to the participants. And this is going to vary within contact uh, and frequency of contact, which we'll talk about briefly here momentarily. Now, it's important to note here that, um, and I've experienced this in both the interviews with the mentors within uh, certain courts in a northeastern state, as well as uh, casual conversations with mentors that um, I've become friendly with, that the mentors themselves can become triggered and that many of these experiences that that this peer mentor programs are substantiated on may be negative experiences, um, for example, combat experience. So we have to take care and there should be some type of protocol um, which should be included as to how to navigate these circumstances and provide proper relief, not only to the mentees who are experiencing uh, um, maybe mental distress, but also the mentors themselves. And this could bring up a lot of negative connotations and in, in a lot of experiences that many of them have not thought about for quite some time. Now, program structure for mentoring programs varies greatly, as I, I mentioned before, and there is no standard or evidence-based approach that currently exists. So uh, this leads directly into and lends itself to the peer mentors not having a defined role. And again, these mentors that I've researched and had conversations with, they're not able to effectively define what their actual roles are as it relates back to the court. And this may produce varying outcomes as to how they approach their roles and what they may be willing to share with the court, if anything, um, with the court. And the defined roles in, in sharing with the court, we see a lot of these themes coming up within the confidentiality. And the courts understand that they want to keep the, the mentor-mentee relationship confidential so that uh, the mentor is not looked at as an agent of the court or you know another probation officer that's going to run back to the court. And that's good, right? So these mentees um, have confidentiality and they can talk about issues that they may be experiencing. But VTCs may choose not to include these mentors in pre-court discussions or in other treatment team meetings. And again, um, whether it be perceived or actual confidentiality, this is what they're trying to enhance. However, I found that this also creates distance between the treatment team and the mentors themselves. And the mentors would comment that they are not part of this court. They are there for the veterans themselves. They're there for their mentees. But anything regarding the court, they are uh, separate from. They are a different entity and they choose to represent their own interests. And what I've heard a lot is, you know, I just do what I think is right, or I'm, I'm learning on the fly. If I think that it's right to contact maybe probation or the VJO, I will, but there's no standard protocol about who they should contact and when outside, of course, if that mentee is going to harm themselves or somebody else. So this could be placing these mentoring programs in conflict with many of the court requirements that are set up to enhance and help these veterans. Um, it could possibly be harming them in some instances as well. And we see this also in the lack of protocol and uh, any type of standardization within engagement methods. These are also not stipulated or standardized across programs that have mentoring uh, components, leading to differences in frequency of contact between the mentors and the mentees, and of course, the types of contact. So should we be meeting face-to-face -face, uh, once a week, twice or three times a month? Uh, telephone contact over the phone is the contact uh, through social media or text messaging. And I'll touch basis on age here in a moment. But one thing with uh, mentors, they seem to be much older in age. So a lot of them struggled with, uh, you know, they thought they were going to be meeting face to face and having um, that type of contact. A lot of them said they had to learn, you know, how to use social media and that as soon as they started texting their mentee, then all of a sudden the conversation opened up. Um, so there was that interesting piece there with the age gap. Now, some courts require peer mentorship and others assign peer mentors to who they believe would benefit the most. And it's, I'm not clear on what criteria they use to say, all right, this individual um, participant needs a mentor versus one that doesn't. But this also creates further issues with evaluating the effectiveness of these mentoring um, components and programs. Are all veteran participants within the court being assigned a peer mentor, or is it being assigned, or are they being assigned by request? Quest. Um, this is something that is going to create an issue as, uh, and I know that this entire panel is interested in evaluating peer mentorship as are other researchers and seeing and comparing these programs as a whole to one another. Now within matching, and this uh, goes back to uh, uh, some excellent points that Erica was touching base on uh, a few slides ago, mentors 
and they're matching. So one thing that I've seen frequently is the mentors say, you know what, it doesn't matter what branch of service, what era, they're veterans, I'm going to help them. But in the same breath, they would also say, you know, I'm I was on a, uh, I was in the Navy. I don't quite understand somebody who had boots on the ground in a combat role um, within, you know, Iraq or Afghanistan. So while they're willing to be matched up with uh, anybody within that court, they want to help. These shared experiences versus era of service, MOS, and roles within the military, um, all these things certainly should play a role when the courts are considering matching. And as I said before, mentors are often older than the participants, and this does provide a disconnect um, between the mentors and mentees. To what extent, we're not quite sure. We're not, we don't know if this is a large uh, issue or an issue at all, but at least in my uh, research, I've come across numerous instances where um, there may be a disconnect there. And of course, as Erica touched base on before, differing service eras and shared experiences relating to branch of service and time of service. Uh, another point Erica touched base on is uh, military sexual trauma and MST and there are few females that I've come across in the role of mentors within these courts and a lot of these courts did have female veterans participating within them and what I through discussing with them and talking with court personnel that they were very reluctant a to be matched with a male mentor um, and quite possibly it would reduce the potential positive impact of having a strong relationship with their mentor themselves and the male mentors were aware of this as well they they felt uncomfortable talking about um, if it did come up mst um, uh, with these female veterans and of course as erica also pointed out mst also impacts male service members and veterans as well um, but just greatly reduced in reporting and quite possibly what they're willing to discuss as well the time commitment needed to be a mentor, and this uh, came up a lot when they were different courts trying to recruit um, and get a large pool of mentors to help with their, uh, their docket in VTC, is that many younger veterans, I've seen them show up to these trainings that we'd organize, and they'd go through the mentor training, but at the end they'd go, you know what, I, I can't can't do this. I can't show up to court every two weeks. I don't have the time commitment able to go out and meet with my veteran in the community, um, whether there be a crisis or not. So it may not be feasible given various work and life commitments. And this may also play into the large um, age disparity that we see as well, that these younger veterans are out there in the workforce. They're trying to um, build uh, these successful professional lives, and they don't have the commitment that older veteran mentors may have through retirement um, or more time to be committed to the court. And again, this plays in directly to the recruitment of the mentors. I know many programs um, that don't have mentoring components, they just don't have a large pool to pull them in. And the requirements also vary greatly. So I know of some programs that I've worked with that will not take mentors who have a criminal charge um, or any type of arrest on their record and other courts, of course, um, especially upon graduation of certain participants, they want to recruit them in because they're familiar with the uh, uh, um, different difficulties of navigating the criminal justice system and, of course, that court uh, specifically. So the outreach to potential mentors, it goes through varying, uh, maybe they are going to go through the VA, maybe they'll go through local veterans organizations um, that exist, and they also have uh, larger get-togethers um, that I've seen in the community where they'll also open it up to all veterans but have that uh, a booth or something set up trying to recruit um, veteran mentors for these programs. And of course, uh, kind of overarching this recognition of this non-uniformity of service. And while many of the mentors I've spoken with state that, again, a veteran is a veteran, they bring up the difficulties of understanding uh, um, kind of these shared experiences, especially with younger service members uh, uh, within the post 9-11 veteran era. And then, of course, the all-important training. How do we train uh, veteran mentors for these courts. And again, as with all of these other components, it varies greatly, which lends itself to the lack of defined roles and how they are to approach their mentees. Now, there are certain, um, I know that uh, Justice for Vets and NADCP have veteran mentor boot camps that they can go through, um, but there's no uniform across the nation uh, training, whether that be online, and can they make it to these other trainings, these national type trainings uh, due to travel and cost um, makes that increasingly difficult as well. 
And this also, the training that does exist has not been externally evaluated. So we simply do not know if there exists any impact on the outcomes for those court participants who are assigned a peer mentor. So it looks really good on paper and it's a very unique aspect to VTCs and a very important one um, to I believe the large majority, but we are just unsure if it has any impact, positive, negative, or maybe no impact on the assignment to those participants um, and, and a peer mentor whether they successfully navigated the court or were removed from the court for various uh, reasons. So a couple quick things that I'd like to touch on. Um, first is that, you know, uh, for Justice for Vets, um, their, their mentor boot camps, um, you know, in the solicitations for funding, um, you can request to attend. Usually that's type part, part of your um, grant proposal for when you're doing a um, implementation or enhancement grant, you can write in to attend um, the trainings. There's also funding streams for, and John, you might know some other ones that might be SAMHSA, um, but also you can apply to have courts, I think, through NADCP Justice for Vets, um, for them to come out to your program to train you. Um, there are some, I think, external evaluations undergo in progress right now, um, especially focusing on the mentor components. I know I'm involved in several of them, and John, I believe you have a few going on right now, so I'm very curious to see um, what the results are from those, and really researchers kind of working together to gather some of the same data and metrics across programs to do kind of a quasi multi-site study. Um, I know several of us are, are engaging in some of those endeavors um, that should hopefully be really helpful in the future to inform these peer mentor, the peer mentorship component of these programs. Um, and I would encourage um, programs to look locally to see not just like veterans organizations, but you might have a type of military veteran peer organization local to you that actually specializes in peer mentoring. So that might be a resource for programs that are having difficulty in getting um, enough mentors for their participants. Um, I know in Texas, at least, I can give a shout out to the military, military veteran peer network um, out there. They do some really great work across the state. And, and I, would, I would just jump in and agree with all of that. And in terms of other types of training, you know, I've, I've just started working with a, um, a, a relatively new mentor group here. And, you know, one of the things their director has been doing, which was very smart, was um, going out and completing some training from the separate through, like, there's, a, there's been a lot of work in recent decades of cultivating peer workers in the behavioral health system, so folks with lived experiences tied to substance use disorders and or behavioral health conditions. So, you know, here locally, one of the mentor leaders has been looking at what can we learn from them. So there's a network of training and resources that exists. Partially, how good of a fit that will be will depend on what a particular mentor program's model is but that can work. And kind of like Julie was saying, some of the other trainings from statewide coalitions, and also as she was alluding to SAMHSA funding, you know, there was that training I mentioned earlier that lots of communities are running mental health first aid trainings with a veteran orientation or similar for suicide prevention that Julie mentioned earlier. So um, again, thinking about if the role of a peer in this court is gonna be that of a lay, lay person, not a professional. There are some good trainings that can help such folks function in, in this kind of gray area. That's basically what they venture. They venture in an area where they're, they're not functioning as professionals, although some of them may have that background, um, but they're doing, they're engaged with a lot of professionals on some fairly high stakes stuff. And just the last piece on the evaluation, yeah, it really, it is something that we need to start to study more. And I think because there's such diversity of models, I mean, I've literally seen one court where what the people they refer to as peer mentors were employed as case managers. Um, you know, really as we as researchers start to report on this, we need to do a good job on the front end of describing the model so that 
you know, we can start to piece out, okay, which types of models are having which types of effects. As we wrap up our discussion, it's important to understand the implications of everything our panel has discussed so far. Who would like to begin? I could begin with this here and touch base on continued growth. So currently, veterans represent uh, less than, uh, slightly less than 10% of the U.S. population, and the overall number of veterans within our population is expected to continually decrease. And this is largely due to the passing of World War II, Korean, and Vietnam era veterans. However, VTCs will likely continue to emerge alongside, this, uh, alongside the decline within this population, and that's as referenced as uh, John even mentioning. I was uh, uh, in a 400 range with current VTCs, and you know, uh, Julie mentioning that now there's uh, more more than 500 potentially. So they're, they're growing exponentially. Now, while there is this predicted decrease in the overall veteran population, diversity within the vet population is increasing. And that uh, kind of harks back to what John was mentioning about um, within group differences. So um, we have to be very careful when looking at um, the diversity within this group of veterans while it is decreasing as compared to the general population. The diversity within that is being much more reflective of the society that they are serving. So the rapid expansion of VTCs is not a, interestingly, it's not a direct response to any type of increased threat posed by returning veterans. And this maybe goes into the stigma that is attached to VTCs and what some people think. Um, incarceration rates are actually much lower among veterans than the general population. And this holds true. Uh, Post 9-11 veterans have lower rates of incarceration than any other era veterans within the United States. Also, uh, this is not uh, the continued emergence of veterans treatment courts is not due to an increased uh, criminogenic need of the veterans. And while veterans are at a higher risk for PTSD and traumatic brain injury, TBI, there exists no causal connection between these factors and increased offending. And in fact, the same factors that increase the risk of offending within the general population also increase the risk of offending within the veteran population as well. So we're looking at this rapid emergence of VTCs and and not linking it with uh, the growing population of veterans um, and certainly not any type of threat posed by veterans returning home that would uh, somehow correlate with uh, the increased need of more and more VTCs that we're seeing. And the number of veterans currently within the CJ system have decreased as veteran courts have increased, which again highlights this is not why they are being rapidly adopted um, and uh, increased across the nation. Now, this may be um, while we're seeing this increase in uh, VTCs and this uh, uh, number of veterans in the criminal justice system decreasing, this could be back to the difficulty in identifying veterans entering the criminal justice system. Do they identify as a veteran um, as we discussed uh, earlier within the webinar? So the question is, why do we see this increase um, given all the um, um, facts that I just stated? And one of the theories or reasons that could be behind this are unfounded fears, and we saw this with post-World War II um, era veterans as well, and this resulted in this proliferation of, uh, there was a few court cases that were created that uh, courts were allowed to take military background, and this happened before we saw any increase in offending and certainly didn't amongst that population, so that may also be driving the increase in veterans treatment courts as well, um, but also this social social societal recognition of the social debt that we owe to veterans. And that's something that John mentioned earlier, that whether we are uh, for or against uh, military action uh, across the globe, especially now with the, the global war on terror, many more people understand that and recognize the societal uh, uh, debt that is owed to veterans, and therefore it's much easier, or could be much easier, according to some recent research I was just reading, um, to create a veterans treatment court than it would be to create a drug court or mental health court based off of uh, public opinion on who they're serving and why they would be serving them. So we see this massive uh, proliferation, this continued growth of veterans treatment courts um, that doesn't quite match up with what we know about the current veteran population and certainly um, uh, the lack of increased threat or risk that they pose, which I find very interesting. Good. Um, I'll talk a little bit about understanding target populations. I think this is extremely important for all um, programs. Um, 
basically to determine program appropriateness, and you can do this through needs assessments. So I understand some programs that I've worked with have wanted to do a needs assessment um, before implementing, before creating and implementing their VTC, um, but they were constrained by, say, a chief judge saying that the program had to start by January 1, and there was no time for this. So, um, but understanding your target populations is extremely important to see if you're going to have the services or if you can acquire or obtain the services that you would need to appropriately treat um, your potential participants. Um, and then also because what we're seeing is some programs being extremely small with, in some cases, one to three uh, participants. And um, so we're going with that. And then once you have your needs assessment, really understand what the issues are for your justice involved um, veteran service member population. Um, communicating that to policymakers, because like I said, again, a lot of times these programs you know, teams are constrained by what the legislation or what they're allowed to do in their jurisdiction. And I think if you have, if you are a partner, if you do have a research partner um, that can come in and do that and help you put it on paper and communicate to those that are making these restrictions, um, hopefully we can have some policy change that would allow programs to be more responsive and in tune to um, their potential clients' needs. Erica, you want to start on information dissemination? Yeah, so information dissemination, it, it's important that we don't perpetuate misinformation, as in when we are kind of sharing our studies and talking about different practices, that we are not looking at military service as something in a negative light, as in the military service kind of changes folks to where we need a separate court system for them and because we cannot process them through uh, the traditional court system. So it's very important to understand the terms and when you're talking about your research or sharing your different practices, you know, note who's in your court. Who is this helping? What types of veterans are these helping? Are these helping your, your Vietnam era or maybe your Gulf War era or maybe your post 9-11 veterans? Are these, are these uh, specific practices working better for your female veterans versus male veterans? Um, those are important things to keep into consideration, especially when you are passing along information. And along with that information dissemination, you know, ensure that you're collecting good data, have a good evaluation um, process in there so you can see your program grow and and monitor these changes and see how these changes uh, affect participant success and what things need to be tweaked so you can gain more participant success. So those are some of the key ideas that I have there. So basically don't perpetuate misinformation and continue to, you know, use the proper terms and to discuss the differences in your veteran participants. I'd like to follow up on that really quickly. Um, for those of us who are doing research in this area, it's really important to um, make the concerted effort to get our research out to non-researchers and those actually doing work in the field. Um, there's a slide that will be coming up that talks, that touches on where you can, um, where practitioners can access some of this information. Um, and how and different ways that researchers are trying to make information available um, to really impact practice and policy. Um, but I think as researchers, since researchers are on the panel, so if there's any researchers in the audience, um, just to really try to make that concerted effort to take your research to the next level um, and really make an impact in, in practice and policy. John, do you want to cover implementation fidelity? Sure. So, you know, so it's so it's, it, we've talked about a lot throughout this. The, you know, the the evidence base on veterans courts is emerging, but I wouldn't look anyone in the eye and say that you know the veteran court model is you know is um, an evidence based intervention yet. But we're relying very heavily on the drug court model, and as we've as we've talked about here, there's 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 very obvious points that, that veterans courts stay very close to drug courts, and there are some obvious places where they're deviating, and then there's some variety in between. 
So, you know, if we step back, we know that although there's still avenues for emerging research and there's still some gaps, the drug court model, in contrast with what I just said, we really can say is an evidence-based intervention that's been shown over time to reduce criminal recidivism, to save public expenditures, to reduce substance use and symptoms of same. Um, so, you know, our, our logical best starting point is basically the lessons that we've learned from the drug court model and trying to be faithful to them. But then also we need to build in that measurement piece. Are there, we've talked about, you know, in the drug court model, we know from research, rewards and sanctions are a huge part of it. Anecdotally, the folks of us around at this panel are saying we're seeing pretty different use of rewards in particular, but also sanctions. Um, we've talked about the, you know, the, the signature edition of the peer mentor model that is intriguing, but pretty much largely untested from an empirical point of view at this point. So, you know, as all of us as practitioners, as researchers, there's, a, there's an obligation on us to kind of start with what we know, but know that it might not fit perfectly and look to describe our findings transparently, to talk about things when they didn't work, right? Both researchers and practitioners can fall in the trap that's very understandable of, well, this didn't seem to reduce recidivism in the way I wanted or hoped, so good Lord, why do I want to share that information? And it is actually some of the most important information we have to share. So, and just the, the last point here is just remembering all of the diversity that we've talked about, right? We've talked throughout this, this seminar on the military specific diversity, the diversity of the courts themselves, but let's also remember that we're talking about criminal justice in modern America, and we need to be factoring in diversity along race and ethnicity and class and behavioral health. So um, it's a fun and a challenging time for those of us trying to get our heads and our hands around this new model. Um, so this is the slide I was just referencing. So this, these are organizations that are in the, B, the Bureau of Justice Assistance Training Technical Assistance Collaborative. So um, as you know, it's the National Drug Court Resource Center, um, has the website that has a, a slew of resources available to um, veterans treatment courts in addition to um, all other types of specialized courts. So I would recommend that you check that out, including the most recent issue of the Drug Court Review, um, in which all of our panelists here today have articles appearing in, fo focuses specifically on veterans treatment courts. Um, you have the National Association of Drug Court Professionals, who provides training and technical assistance um, to VTCs, through also NDCI and Justice for Vets. Um, and their conference is coming up, but their website has a large amount of resources available. And also the Center for Court Innovation has some really great stuff uh, for veterans treatment courts and strategic planning. And then the Tribal Law and Policy Institute um, is actually hosting a symposium in August on uh, tribal veterans uh, symposium. So I would encourage um, all of our listeners to check out um, these organizations and the great work that they're doing through the BJA TTA Collaborative. And then also, um, if anybody has, there's the Veterans Justice and Mental Health newsletter that we put out monthly. Um, it's usually between the first and the fifth of the month. Um, it has some really great resources. Uh, it has a spotlight. It has recent research related to veterans justice and mental health, um, different resources for programs monthly, and also policy updates. It also provides uh, an overview of events or list of events that are happening across the country that um, are related to veterans. And actually, I like that list. I tell a lot of my programs to check it out because 
um, they will use some of those events as outings or assist in a stand down that's happening locally. Um, so if you haven't, I would definitely check out that newsletter. And if you have, thank you for subscribing and continue to, continuing to read. <laughs> All right, now we're gonna move on to the question and answer session. First of all, I want to thank all of our panelists for the time they put into preparing for this event. The first thing that I want to address is that many of you have asked if this webinar will be available at a later date. I'm happy to say that an archived version will be available soon and that you will receive an email when it is available on our website. And you should be able to watch it and download it at that time. Now for some of the questions that you submitted for our panelists. First, I'd like to ask a question from Ursula Castellano. And she asks, do we know what percentage of the veteran population is justice involved, i.e. in pretrial, probation, jail, or prison? Which of our panelists would like to address that? I, I don't know an exact percentage. I will start off by saying, though, um, definitely agree with Paul. The data is clear that, you know, when we compare veterans versus non-veterans in doing other, some folks have done some nice studies using census data, um, veterans are less likely to be certainly incarcerated. I am, there's great DOJ studies that would show a, lower rates of incarceration in our nation's jails and prisons among veterans. The other questions are really interesting though, the pre-booking and all the other stages. Um, so DOJ in their, the periodic survey they do of all inmates has been including veteran status for years. So we can look at not only the current level, but the changes in rates of veteran incarceration over time, which is kind of what was setting up what Paul was talking about with different rates for um, Iraq and Afghanistan veterans. What, what we don't have a counterpart of, at least if it's there, I've missed it, and I'd be curious to hear, when I tried to review FBI data through the uh, UCRs that would look at like, the data not coming from prisons and jails, but coming from police, there doesn't seem to be a veteran code on that national data. So we are much blinder on rates of arrest, people in early, you know, pre-booking status. I'm curious if anyone else has thoughts or experiences. Yes, yeah, so I think that the, the BJS, so the Bureau of Justice Statistics data, I think that's the DOJ data that you might have been referencing, um, John. I think it typically says 8 to 10 percent um, of the incarcerated population um, has served in the military. Um, I typically put the caveat whenever I write about this that I think that these are underestimates, again, because these are, this is self-report. Um, and there is a slew of reasons why individuals do not want to report their, uh, their military status. Um, I believe, Erica, you've done some work with yeah. DOC yeah. data in Florida. I was wanted... going to jump in and say that that uh, resource was the survey of inmates in state and federal correctional facilities. Their last data poll was 2012. Um, the data currently, as far as I know, is uh, not publicly available currently. So. We're still waiting on that, uh, but they said between, uh, I think it's like 9.4% now that we are seeing that um, those who report military status are either in state or federal correctional facilities. Jail's a little more fuzzier with that, and then haven't heard uh, much of anything about anyone doing community corrections. Um, that would probably be something that you would have to seek out in your own local jurisdiction or state for that information. So I just want to follow up and say I think that's the importance of it, it reflects the importance of why we need like accurate data and really trying to um, ascertain uh, the military status of of offenders um, because I don't think that we have a very clear clear picture. Um, so yeah, you, you're correct with that, Julie. And 
keep in mind, these data sets are not created to look at veterans. They're created to look at offenders as a whole. So we're missing a lot of these variations in military service in looking at these different data sources. Thank you for answering that. Our next question comes from Monica Christofferson, and she asks, for the courts who use a nexus determination, who is making that decision, and how are they making that decision? I'll start with this one. Um, so it varies by court, which is what I essentially feel like is the theme of um, this webinar. But um, yeah, so they they have different nexus definitions. Um, and I've seen it where the, the team decides. I've seen it where it is up to the judge to decide. Um, it's the coordinator. Um, and actually prosecution in a lot of programs has the ultimate say. Um, so, and it doesn't specifically say in the jurisdictions that have it in their legislation or in their policy manuals that how they will show there is a nexus. They just say that there, should, there, there must be a nexus. And so the treatment teams will typically just determine whether they believe one exists. Um, I have worked with a couple programs also that have the VJO try and pull information from um, the military documents or discharge papers to show that there could be a nexus um, with certain types of experiences or reasons for discharge um, and use that. But that's been in my experience with programs. Yeah, and I can uh, comment on that as well. Um, Kansas, arguably speaking with some of the, uh, the courts there, um, have one of the most limiting nexus. And while what Julie was talking about is absolutely right, and they can kind of navigate uh, the, di the different courts or VTCs can navigate uh, some of them. Some of them are, are, are very hard put. So it lists, Kansas lists honorably discharged, right? So to be in a VTC, you must be honorably discharged. You must be a combat veteran. Again, how do they determine combat? Um, do they use uh, uh, the military definition for that, or can, is there some leeway there? And then it must be a mental health condition that is service-related, and that condition led the ve uh, veteran to commit a nonviolent crime. So there can be some navigation of some of those definitions or within that nexus, but other, others are, are very hard put and very difficult to navigate and maybe limiting the amount of veterans entering, entering those courts, at least within that state. So, Paul, I think she's talking about the nexus between the crime and either mental health status or um, uh, it's basically military service. So there has to be some type of nexus. So for Candace, you said that what was the nexus element for their requirement? Oh, my apologies. We, we can use that as a footnote and, and throw that down on the bottom then. But uh, no, so the nexus of intertwining definitions of a veteran who would be uh, able to or eligible to enter a veteran's treatment court. And they have certain, uh, this nexus has to be navigated, of course, by that, that individual uh, treatment court, but the legislation in Kansas put it out there that, you know, again, honorably discharged, combat veteran, service-related mental health condition that led to the nonviolent crime. So my apologies for the confusion there. Oh, gosh, gotcha. yeah. All right. Um, our next question comes from Kelly Jones, who asks, are VTCs looking at implementing family-centered approaches to ensure that family members receive services to address their trauma as well? So I'm just aware of a recent uh, push to do this and working with a court to set something up, but I, in my experience, have not um, Seen, I haven't seen this, so I, I punt this to the other panelists. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen it either, but what I do know is that they will connect um, combat veterans to vet centers where actually participants can receive um, family counseling through that, but that is specific to combat vets. So if you haven't seen combat, you're not eligible for that service. 
And I believe that there's like approximately 300 vet centers across the country, and that might be a great resource for um, BTC teams um, to check into. You know, it's, it's interesting. A, it's just a really great question. And like the others, I've not seen it. I've seen little things that make me think the course I've worked with wouldn't be adverse. Um, it's, um, you know, I think a lot of it, my guess is, you know, funding makes that stuff hard. But just, you know, borrowing from some other systems I've, I've worked in, you know, we've seen great work that's been done in the mental health community using, and I know it's different than the specific question, but like the uh, family psychoeducation model. So there are models out there of support for family members on how they can help someone work through some things, how they can deal with their own, their own consequences of someone's trauma. Um, and even, I know some states have figured out ways to like bill Medicaid for that, you know, family psycho ed. So a service given to the non-official client. So it just, you know, again, Julie mentioned the themes of this, of this panel discussion, you know, one of them is clearly we have so much more work to do. It's a promising model that's rapidly disseminating and so many more interesting avenues to go down. But it's a fascinating question. I wrote down a note on it. All right. Our next question is from Caroline Delane, who asked, do you think that not terminating participants is more about keeping numbers up or is it about something else? Why not make room for someone new instead of someone who is not complying with court requirements? So I actually haven't run into any programs that are at max capacity. So I'm not sure that the, at least, I mean, I haven't. So I'm not sure if um, it's really precluding other uh, potential participants from entering the program. Um, I have seen the non-termination in a program that is very small, so it could be a, a numbers issue. I'm not totally sure um, because that's something that hasn't been explicitly expressed. Um, and there was no concern for funding tied to a certain amount of individuals in the program. And that's pretty much all I can report on my end. Yeah, I've seen the same thing, Julie. It hasn't been tied to number of participants. It's more on um, the team feeling sympathetic, um, you know, feeling for the participant. Um, in one case, I can tell you there was a participant who had uh, spent 30 plus years home homeless, finally had got some stable housing, and the team was very reluctant to turning that individual um, back on the streets and, and kicking them out of the program because this is the first time in their entire life that they've had a stable structure. So they kept that individual in the program um, against some of the wishes of the others. And, and I think to a large extent, this is just courts getting their hands dirty with the work of social service. And I, I don't say that in a pejorative way. I'm a you know, social service professional. It's, um, you know, I think if we took courts and veterans out of this, there are conversations being held by clinical teams across the country today on, you know, should we let this person continue in our residential drug treatment program despite the rule violations? You know, it's um, just predicting human behavior is really, really hard and good professionals struggle with it and have different orientations. Um, yeah. Thank you. Our next question comes from Donna Harrison, who asked, are you seeing participation from state veteran services organizations in your VTCs across the nation? I have seen them provide some mentoring services um, and do outings with veterans. In Arizona, I've seen them used uh, pretty effectively to help with um, people who enter the courts without VA eligibility 
but there might be a path to eligibility, reviewing separation status or something else. I've seen the state reps help with that process. John, thanks for mentioning that. That slipped my mind. I've seen that across several um, jurisdictions also. All right. Um, our next question is from Steve Bender, who asked, can you address the importance of fully reintegrating veterans back into the community? So I'll, I'll jump in and take a stab and curious for others. So, you know, it's, there was a comment that Paul made kind of quickly a little bit ago, but it was really important. And it's that, you know, from research, we know that exposure to combat in and of itself does not increase risk of criminal justice involvement. Um, so people don't end up in veterans courts because they went to war per se. Um, you know, we get a little closer when we look at like PTSD in terms of is there a causal path? I'm, I'm still not sure that that's, that that's the case. But what, what we're seeing is kind of what Paul was alluding to is that um, the, the similar predictors of criminal justice involvement among civilians is similar with veterans. And, you know, one of those is social connections. And, and that also then it starts to bump up against the military experience, re-entry. There have been some researchers at the VA that have been doing some nice work on, um, you know, resiliency and predicting um, PTSD and civilian reintegration and post-military social supports are very important in, in all of those processes. So, um, just really, you know, your, your point is getting at something essential, you know, when, whether we're thinking about this from a criminal justice perspective or from a social service perspective, you know, good treatment for folks, showing some good deference to their preference, of course, but generally good treatment is helping people find a useful social role, right? You know, psychiatric medications, counseling can be very helpful and very important for people, but you know, a life where you're connected, having the ability to call someone who will help you when you're in a, when you're in a tough spot. You know, the, the mentor program I've started working with here locally, one of the outcomes we want to measure is a couple of them are social connectedness for that reason, and also a measure of self-efficacy, which is kind of getting at, you know, after working with the mentor components, are people feeling more able to, there's an independent network of people they can call for assistance and or they have more confidence in their own ability to walk through those issues. Thanks for the question. All right, we're gonna take one more question and that is going to be a question from Richard Schwermer who asked, a panelist mentioned obvious differences between drug court practices and VTC practices. Other than the mentor prevalence and the higher incidence, I'm sorry, I'm losing the, hang on one second. Technical difficulties. And the higher incidence of PTSD and other co-occurring issues, are there differences to which we should pay attention? I think our panel today covered a lot of um, issues that teams and researchers and uh, should really be attuned to. Um, I mean, really these programs I do believe are the most complex type of specialized court. They take a host of mental and health, mental health, mental and behavioral health issues. Um, they are not necessarily um, focusing on a specific type of offense. Um, they really are more of the general status of a military service. So I think being really in tune to the population that your program is or should be targeting. So we talked about the 
military um, characteristics of the individuals. We want to be attuned to um, the varied mental and behavioral health aspects. Um, a lot of these programs deal with uh, housing challenges, um, other social supports. Um, you know, there's the peer-to-peer -peer aspect of these. So I think in a lot of ways, um, there's and, and they're very varied depending on the jurisdiction. So um, I just think that focusing on the participant or potential participant population um, is important and it widely varies. And I think it does potentially do more so than other types of specialized courts. I'm not sure if anybody else really wants to tackle that, but it would be great. No, and going off that, uh, the important point there is the complexity that veterans treatment courts are dealing with. And as, as Julie was saying, it's, you know, we have drug courts that look at substance dependence, and we, we know a lot of the, what the literature says on that. And then, you know, uh, mental health courts came out of that and a lot of co-occurring um, issues, right? So now we're dealing with uh, possible uh, substance dependence and a diagnosed uh, mental illness or mental illness is that increases the difficulty for positive outcomes and how you navigate participants through that system. Um, and of course, you know, a slew of other uh, problem solving courts. But now with the veterans courts, now we're dealing with a subset of person, right? We're dealing with a veteran, not a drug charge, not a dependency, not a mental illness. Now we're dealing with a person that could be experiencing one, if not uh, both of those, a, a, a co occurring diagnosis, but also. Um, maybe not a mental illness or not a, a substance dependency um, issue. So these courts are opening their doors to a, a very large population. And while, yes, we know piecemeal um, things about the veteran uh, uh, population and how they're distinct, how they operate through the courts and what we would say, oh, you know, to get to that evidence-based uh, standpoint where we say, okay, this works given these, you know, variables or these circumstances, we're, we're not quite there yet. Um, so the complexity of these courts, while we know them on face value, much more uh, research, many more researchers and research teams will be uh, fleshing that out. But I think kind of as a uh, go to the drug court model has been quickly adapted to these you know various problem solving courts and then it's up to quality research and assessment and continuing evaluation in order to say does this work with this population um, within this jurisdiction and then we can continue to build uh, off of that i think another difference is that in these courts we're dealing with a veteran identity we're working through that to help um, individuals kind of reintegrate back in and kind of understand um, maybe the nexus or the issues behind their substance abuse, mental health problem that led to um, their criminal behavior that landed them into the court. So that's something unique that we don't necessarily see in drug or mental health courts. And that concludes our question and answer session. We want to thank you again for attending this event. We hope you were able to learn something new and take away some helpful insights for informing your veterans treatment court research, policy, and practice. Please follow or contact us at the Justice Programs Office for additional information, news, and great events. This concludes today's webinar. <laughs>